good deal of our story about uh, the Schrodinger equation. We discussed about the current density, the current, okay, the continuity equation. Now we are ready to uh, approach the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this will be our next uh, time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay? The idea is the following. You remember, this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Psi x and t equal to h psi h and t. Okay? If h does not depend on time, this is a particular case, so there are no external potential in the lab that somehow change in time, then you know that I can write an explicit solution in a rather formal way, in this way. Okay, and remember that this is the explicit form of the evolution operator, which at time zero is equal to the identity, and at time t is a complicated object born out of the exponential function of the Hamiltonian, so it involves all powers of h, and so you understand that p squared plus v, they do not commute, so please do not split them. <laughs> Okay? And to all powers, you act with p squared and v in all orders, so it's a real mess, okay? Nevertheless, this object is in principle there, a well-defined object. Okay, good. Now, I want to check if there are solutions that are very special, okay? So I want to find special factorized solution. When I say factorize, I mean the following, that the dependence on t and the dependence on x is separated into factors, okay? So, question, can I find solutions of this kind, some function of t times some function of x? Okay? Uh, the answer is yes. Okay? Try the following. Okay? Suppose that I solve this problem. H phi of x equal to E phi of x. Okay? So I find a negative function of the Hamilton operator with the eigenvalue E. These are the eigenvalues. Okay, and these are the eigen functions or vectors. Since here the vectors are really functions, these are called eigen functions or eigen states also. Same names. Mm -hmm. Of the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay? This is, I, as I reminded you several times, is the analog of, of the eigenvalue problem in linear algebra. A times a vector equal to lambda times a vector. Okay? Remember, A applied to the vector equal to lambda B. All right? Good. Except that now this is an operator acting on very special vectors that are this infinitely dimensional uh, states of the Hilbert space. Okay. If this can be found, and indeed we'll see that it's not only one, in general there are very many of those solutions, okay? So you can also add indices here to be concrete, let me add an index n, okay? But do not think that this is necessarily an integer. It's just a label so far. It could be a continuous index even. But this is just to remind you that I can have several of those Eigen states, in fact, an infinite number in general. We'll see later. Hmm. Well, in any case, if this is uh, found, this object is found, then I can put together 
with a factor of this kind, okay, and construct for you the following state, side n of x and t, okay, so it's a factor, exactly in the way you see there, and this is a solution of this equation, okay? Let's verify, so I take i, h bar, the derivative with respect to time of this object, okay, of psi n of x and t, how much it is according to our story, it is equal to i, h bar, we bring down the factor minus i, t n, divided by h bar, right, and then you put the same exponential, remember the derivatives of the exponential, right, okay, and then I put phi n of x, good, and then you see this usual cancellation happens, i times minus i is equal to plus 1, okay, so this thing is really plus e n, e minus e t n t over h bar times t n of x. Hmm? But you see clearly that this object here is nothing but, by the way, you can put whatever you want, these are factors, okay, so you can put it here, and this is equal to h applied to t n. Right? So the whole thing is equal to h, sorry, e to the minus i e n t over h bar, h applied to phi n of x. So far, this is clear, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to prove that this is equal to h times the state. Well, but sure. This is a linear operator, okay? So this factor here, you can bring it close to the function, and uh, obviously it doesn't change because the, the linear operator applied to a function or a function multiplied by some complex number is absolutely the same. So this can be also brought there. Hmm? And so this thing is equal to h applied to precisely the object we started from. So, psi n of x and t. Okay? So, indeed, given the medium that states and the function of the Hamiltonian with the value en, these special solutions, mm, factorized, mm, are solutions of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. This is the t dependent Schrodinger equation. This eigenvalue problem, okay, it is often called the time independent Schrodinger equation, okay, because it's a, I mean, an equation that Schrodinger itself wrote, but involves simply an eigenvalue problem, no explicit dependence on time. The dependence on time for the states that you find here is trivial. It's simply an exponential complex modulus one phase in front. That's it. We have verified that indeed this is a solution. And by the way, I say you can prove in the notes, I think I do it this way, that all possible solutions of this form must be associated to uh, one of the other functions. Okay? There are no other factorized solution except for the ones that I just described. Okay? Good. Uh, but these are not the most generic solutions. They are special factorized solutions. But it is important that in, in some sense with this you can construct any other possible solution by linearity. Remember that the Schrodinger equation is linear. So in some sense I have described the basic ingredients that will allow to solve this problem for more general initial conditions. Because it is a, remember that this is always an initial condition problem. You have a differential equation, but you have to tell me what psi of x at time t equals zero is. 
Okay? So fix an initial condition and then find the solution. In the case I have just described, the initial condition is very, very special. It's one of the initial functions of the Hamiltonian, right? In general, we will try to understand how to solve a generic initial condition, okay? In a second. Before I do that, I just want to point out that this very special factorized solutions have the following property. First of all, if I associate the corresponding probability density, which is the modulus square of it, you realize immediately that the modulus square of this complex unit one, uh, unit modulus phase, doesn't matter. So it is equal to phi n of x modulus square. So immediately you realize that the probability density associated up to, with this eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are in fact constant in time. And that's the reason why these states here, they are called also stationary states. Okay? Stationary states. Another uh, immediate consequence of this Remember the continuity equation, the derivative in general with respect to time of P of x and T is equal to minus the divergence of the current action T. Now, in the special case that we have here, the current itself is not depending on time. This is not depending on time. This is equal to zero, therefore, and therefore, further consequence, the divergence of J for the stationary states is equal to zero. Okay, so the divergence, uh, the stationary states have a divergence, which is a, a vector field which has no divergence in space. Okay. In one dimension in particular is constant. The, co the current must be constant. Okay. Is it clear? Let's proceed. Let's tackle this problem. Now, there is a, a, a theorem of mathematics, and therefore I will just skip it in some sense. I will not prove it, but it is a, a theorem of mathematics. If, the, if I have an operator, emission operator in particular. Uh, in the Hilbert space of functions, okay, appropriately normalized, blah, 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 then the eight states of this uh, operator, any emission operator in fact, not only the Hamiltonian, but in particular for the Hamiltonian, if I collect the whole set of those functions, okay, they form a basis of the Hilbert space. So a basis of the space. Basis uh, means the following thing. Any element in this space can be expanded in terms of those things. Okay? Pretty much as the three unit vectors in three-dimensional space form a basis for the space. Any vector can be expressed as a linear combination of these three elements. It's same here, okay? Any, any state in the Hilbert space can be expressed in terms of this phi n of x. Now, notice here again, I'm using a discrete index n, but it's only just to convey the idea. Now, how many of those, usually inf infinity in fact, in general, but they are discrete, they are continuous, they are both and both. Uh, it's up to the problem. For instance, for the harmonic oscillator, we will see these functions are a discrete set of infinite, discrete set of functions. For the uh, hydrogen atom, no, there is a discrete part, an infinite number of them, and then there is a continuum part. Okay? So, depending on the problem, the way to specify those number, those n, should uh, be taken care of, okay? It's not only a basis. Like when you have uh, x, y, and z, 
You know that this is a very special basis, it's called orthonormal basis. In other words, the scalar product of any two of these is zero. Mm -hmm. Well, you can take, you can always assume that this basis is indeed orthonormal according to the scalar product we are defining in the Hilbert space. So that, for instance, phi n, phi n prime is equal to uh, 1 if n is equal to n prime and 0 otherwise. Now here, I'm really heavily using the discrete nature of this uh, object here. Okay, So in principle you might be skeptical and say, but what about if this is not an integer but the collection of integers, or even if it is a partially uh, con a, a continuous label? But, uh, this, this discussion will come in a while. For the time being, let me just be uh, brief and let's say that this object here we will call delta n n prime, delta in this way, this is the Kronecker delta, okay, not the Dirac delta. Mm. Good. Now, we'll see later on cases where this must be generalized in some sense because the continuous nature of this thing does not... In the end, the problem is that when you have a continuous spectrum, mm, the associated alien functions are not localized and they are not normalizable. It's pretty much, we will see, in the case of a free particle. Free particle will explain the whole story and we will see it in a second. Okay? For the time being, let's, let's keep it like this as a kind of formal approach. Okay? So, for any Hamiltonian or for any in fact permission operator, you can uh, if you solve and find the alien states, then you find the basis, an orthonormal basis of the space. Well, orthonormal means that, suppose that you call this function psi zero of x, with the obvious meaning of zero, zero means time zero, hmm? this is the initial condition, initial condition, okay? Then I can expand this in terms of the phi n. Okay? So I can write psi 0 of x equal to sum over this indices n, whatever they are, on some appropriate coefficient cn times the function phi n of x. Is it clear? Yes. This because this is a basis. Okay? So any state can be written this way. And now I ask you, okay, given this, given this initial condition, can you tell me what is the corresponding psi of x and p that comes out? Okay, let me erase this. We have just used it already. The question is simple. In principle, what I would need to do is the following. I apply the, uh, this operator here, the evolution operator. So e to the minus i h t over h bar applied to uh, applied to the initial state, but the initial state is this object here. So sum over n c n phi n of x. Right? This is what I should calculate. Now remember, this is a linear operator. It's the exponential of a linear operator, so it's a linear operator. So I can actually bring it inside the sum. This is absolutely the same thing as sum over n, c n, the exponential acting on one of those states. Hmm? But now, I know that h acting on phi n is equal to e n phi n. This is an alien state, an alien vector of h. Now you know that if this is an alien state of h, the application of any function of h is very, very simple because not only h uh, gives you this, but for instance, h square will give you e n square, h cube, h to any power, n, uh, say, m, okay, will give you this. And therefore, the exponential of this 
a vectorial operator will give you sum over n cn e to the minus i e n over x bar. So it becomes a number. Okay? So this operator, when acting on this, which is a media state of h, becomes magically a simple thing, a pure number of modulus 1. Okay? This is the miracle. If I had to apply this or any other state that is not a negative state of H, it would be a real mess. But since this is a negative state of H, then it's a pure angel. It's a very, very simple thing. Okay? Good. And so you see immediately that you start from a state where you have some coefficients, and this coefficient, each one of them, gets simply a phase factor. Now, this looks like a very simple thing. Every phase factor is modified. Nevertheless, the shape of the function, believe me, changes dramatically. Okay? This, in some sense, is what, in general, if you suppose that you start from some wave packet, something localized here, yes. okay? you analyze this wave packet in terms of eigenstates states of the Hamiltonian, which are indeed the plane waves in our simple wave packet we did at the beginning. And then we let each of them evolve with this phase factor, which is the, fa the factor e to the minus omega kt that you have in your integral. And then you have to reconstruct the sum. The shape is enormously different. Although, the, by the look of it, it's a very, very simple uh, modification that you have. Okay? So formally, if I have solved the time dependent Schrodinger equation, I know how to approach the time, uh, sorry, the time independent Schrodinger equation. I know how to approach the time dependent Schrodinger problem for any initial condition. Okay? I just expand the state and then I put factors which are the uh, eigenvalue associated to this m here in the factor. Is it clear? Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that this is simple to do, okay? Because again, it requires that you solve that problem, you expand this function. Ah, by the way, let's ask the following question. This is a basis, okay? So can I ask you how you find the coefficient? If I, if, if you have in three-dimensional space the three vectors, x, y, and z, and I give you a vector v, how do you find this vector will be some, say, uh, uh, vx times x plus vy times y plus vz times z. How do you find these three numbers? Huh? You? Yes, you take the scalar product. So this object here, vx is the scalar product of x with v, okay? Uh, vy is the scalar product of y with v, and so on, okay? So what do you do here? The same thing, okay? So you, uh, yeah, okay? I have this uh, state here, so psi 0 equal to sum over n uh, cn. Uh, let me write it in this funny Dirac notation, okay? Here there were, were uh, functions, now I uh, use a slightly more abstract notation. This vector state here I denoted by psi 0, okay? No reference to x. Uh, uh, this uh, phi n or x I denote by uh, phi n uh, cat, okay? both cat. Mm. So I really make a reference to x because it's simpler. Now, let's take the scalar product of this with, say, a certain, uh, let's call it, um, in fact, c, uh, sorry, phi n prime. Okay? Let's see what counts. Well, by linearity, okay, you can write this as sum over n, cn times 
the scalar product of phi n prime and phi n. But this is a multi-normal basis, and therefore only the term n equal to n prime survives. Okay? So this is the product of delta. Okay? So in the sum, in the end, only n prime survives, and you get C n prime. Okay? So the way you get D coefficient is precisely as in the Cartesian case, take the scalar product with the appropriate basis factor. Okay? So in principle the problem is simple, so to speak. To solve this initial value time depend time in uh, dependent Schrodinger problem, solve the eigenvalue value problem for the Hamiltonian. Energies and functions. Expand the state by finding the coefficient through scalar product, which means integrals. Mm -hmm. And then attach to every single coefficient a phase factor, which changes a lot the shape of the state and make the wave packet travel in a complicated manner. Is it uh, clear the problem? Mm -hmm. Obviously, not simple at all to do all this calculation in practice. Mm -hmm. But in principle, that's the way to go. Okay, let me just give you uh, a, sim a simple, in fact, the simplest of those problems that you can think of, which will let you understand better this issue about discreteness, continuity, what, what uh, uh, normalization. Uh, Dirac you know, versus Kronecker. Okay, let's let's approach the free particle. Okay. The free particle. Okay. Should I erase things? Maybe, but not. Maybe not. Okay, so my next problem is in fact to consider H equal to P squared over 2L. Or if you want minus H bar squared the Laplacian over 2L. Okay? And for simplicity I do it in one dimension, mm? although three dimension is absolutely the same story. Mm? So I, I will consider the operator which is second derivative with respect to x divided by 2L the minus sign we draw. That's h. Okay. So I want to know the eigenfunctions of this object. Okay? Notice this is p squared. You already know that the eigenfunctions of p are plane waves, right? Okay, let's revise p is equal to minus i h bar the gradient, so in this case the derivative. Mm -hmm. And you know that t applied to e to the i k x is equal to h bar k times e to the i k x. So you might say, uh -huh, then this is an eigen function of p with the eigen value h bar k. And therefore I know that p squared applied to this we have just an eigen function h bar k squared. Okay? And therefore, automatically, h, the free particle, applied to e to the i k x equal to h bar k squared over 2m times the same function. So we're done. We discover this phi n the plane waves and the corresponding eigenvalues, which are this. Okay, you notice immediately the following thing. First of all, k is any number on the real axis. So it's a continuous. So in some sense, I might call this object phi k of x equal to e i k x. So I'm labeling the solutions with this k, not n, but k, which is a continuous object. So this is enough. Right? Good. Fact number one. 
Second, what about normalization? I promised that ob uh, object associated to different uh, um, values uh, should be orthogonal. Hmm? Are they? First of all, are they normalizable? So, according to this prescription, phi n, phi n should be equal to 1. Okay? But if I calculate the uh, uh, scalar product for this with itself, uh, the integral is 1 over all space is infinity. Okay? So you immediately realize that phi k, phi k is really infinity. These are not normalizable functions. Okay? You might say, okay, then we throw them away. Useless. No, they are not useless. Keep them. Okay? They can always be useful. Okay, we'll see in a second how to play with them hmm? in a meaningful way. First of all, obviously, you can put any factor you want here and the infinity remains infinity. Okay? So you will realize that what should I put here? I don't know. Let's see. We will see that there is a very special factor here that is, for instance, 1 over square root of 2 pi. This is better than any other factors for certain aspects. And this infinity becomes a meaningful infinity, which is the Dirac delta infinity. This will come in a second. Okay? But let me explain what is the trick by which you do this. Okay? It can be seen as a trick that this is really a formal device that uh, it works. Okay? The trick is uh, the following. It's called periodic boundary condition. It's very, very often used in condensed matter. Mm -hmm. That is the following. I will explain again this to you in 1D. In 3D it is exactly the same, except that plane waves here have k vector, which is a vector dot x. Okay. So rather than working in the infinite space as this, by the way, let me ask you, what about e of k? e of k. If you plot it versus k, which is here, this line, it's just a parabola, right? And so if I ask you what are the possible eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian, you should tell me all possible positive numbers, including zero. Okay? So this is the so-called spectrum of this Hamiltonian. The spectrum, in general, is the set of all possible eigenvalues. And in this case, you realize that it's a continuous spectrum. It's not a discrete spectrum, as we will find, for instance, in the harmonic oscillator or in the vowel state of the hydrogen atom. We will find discrete states. And then there is a continuous part afterwards. Here is purely continuum. Okay? The continuum set. All right. Let's play these games. Periodic boundary condition. They are often abbreviated PBC in the paper. And the game works like this. This is now not K space, but is uh, position space. So it's the X. I don't work in the infinite line. I work on a segment of a certain length L. Okay? More precisely between minus n over 2 and the lower. This is my interesting region. Okay? Whatever function I have here, I assume that the function is periodically replicated wherever, in all other cells. I will not do it nicely, but you know what I mean. So I, what I mean is that if I look for that, if I look for the Psi at x plus L, that's exactly equal to the Psi of x. Okay? These are periodic function of period L. Hmm? Good. 
periodic. Very good. So I restrict my consideration to a finite region and then periodic functions in this finite region replicated over the whole space. All right. Now, suppose that you have a plane wave. Can you make it periodic? Can I take e to the i kx and have it periodic with period L? The answer is yes. Let's see why. Just sum L and pretend that this is exactly the same thing as e to the i kx. What conditions k has to satisfy? You see that this cancels, okay? So this implies e to the i k times l coincident with y. What case do satisfy this condition? Well, this object has to be a multiple of 2 pi. Yeah. Any integer multiple of 2 pi. So k times l should be 2 pi times n, where n belongs to what they are called the integers, the z. 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 up to plus infinity and minus infinity, okay? Or if you want k equal to this, okay? Good. So these are the k's. They are not all of them. They are a discrete, although infinite, subset of the real axis of momentum space, the K, okay? You see? These are the 2 pi over L times N, N equals 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So the discretization here in momentum space is 2 pi over L. The larger it is L, the smaller, the finer is this discretization, okay? Now, obviously, if these are the K, the corresponding E of K, so the associated eigenvalues, are discrete. So E of 0 is this, E of 1 is invisible, is here, there, okay? So these are the points, okay, of the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. Now, the spectrum is discrete again. So rather than having this continuous line, I have this, 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 and so on, right? So I have transformed my equation by imposing this condition of being working with the finite cell and periodic bounding condition. I have transformed my problem in two ways. First of all, my k's are now discrete, infinite but discrete, not continuous. Second, the spectrum correspondingly has become discrete and not continuous, okay? Two nice features when you work with things, having discrete objects. Mm. Second, can I normalize those functions? Obviously not in infinite space. In infinite space, they will always be uh, uh, not normalizable. But can I normalize it in each finite region of length L? Yes, I can. Okay, let's See what is the normalization I need. Mean. It's not one over root two pi, by the way. Okay? So I will explain to you now. Well, this will be useful later on, but I, I erase it. Okay? I define phi tilde of k or x to be 1 over square root of L e to the i k times x. You see, I put a factor square root of L. Is it clear? And the k's are this ones. These are my functions that I would like to consider. They are proportional to the plane waves with a very special factor. Let's calculate phi tilde of k phi tilde of k prime. Obviously, when I mean this, I mean let's restrict the integral on this region here. Okay? So let's do it. It's 1 over square root of L, 1 over square root of L, and it has the integral between minus L over 2 and L over 2, 
and then I have e to the ik prime minus k because I have the star here times x in the x. Now, can you do this integral? No need for Google. Even I can do it. Okay. <laughs> and this, because this is an exponential, not with complex coefficient, but the integration forms are absolutely identical. So this is equal to 1 over L. The primitive function of this is I to the k prime minus kx divided by I k prime minus k. And then I have to evaluate it between L over 2 and minus L over 2. Okay, let's do the calculation. 1 over L. Okay, it's the numerator only, so it's e to the i k prime minus k L over 2 minus e to the minus i k prime minus k L over 2 divided by i k prime minus k. Is it clear? Okay? That's the integral. Good. Now, <coughs> I proceed. I notice that e to the i something minus e to the minus some, something divided by 2i, let me put the 2, is something that we know very well. Sorry. It's the sum, right? Remember, all your formula for the complex exponential is the neighboring lecture room. I think it's quoted there. Right? So, this is equal to 2 over L. Mm? And then I have the sine of k prime minus k L over 2 divided by k prime minus k. Okay? A very nice result. Mm? Simple. And now you might ask, you told us that this should be a Kronecker delta, but how come? I mean, this is a horrible function. Well, not so horrible. Yeah. Let's see. Suppose that I have k and k prime given by these two things. Okay? So what is k prime minus k? Or better yet, k prime minus k multiplied by L over to the argument of that side. So it's equal to 2 pi over L. Then let's call n prime the inlet, the integer associated to k prime, and n that associated to k. Then I multiply by L over 2. Zap, 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 zap. So this object is pi times an integer. Okay? So this is the sign of pi times an integer. So how much it is? Sign of pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. Zero, 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 zero. So it's zero everywhere. Mm. Well, there is one case for which I cannot argue like this. Which one? K prime equal to K. Because here I have sign zero over zero. How do you determine the limit of sin x over x, you remember? It goes to 1. Sin x over x, okay, is something that for x going to 0 goes to 1. In order to, in fact, rewrite it in that way, notice that I can put this factor there, okay? So you see, it's sin x over x. When this object goes to 0, the correct way to say what it is, it is 1. Okay? So it is indeed 1 or 0. 1 if the two k vectors are the same, 0 otherwise. Okay? As promised. Pretty nice. Okay, let's reinstall the usual way of writing. Okay, so I have devised functions that are periodic, made of the plane waves, with the appropriate choice of k's and an appropriate normalization which satisfy all the requirements of being a nice sort of normal basis. Hmm? Now, because of that, you remember what I raised from there, that given the basis, I can expand any periodic function in this interval in terms of this object. What this expansion is, it has associated the name, is the Fourier series expansion. Okay? 
essentially what I am writing in this piece of board for you is the Fourier series expansion for periodic functions in this interval. Okay, let me just let me just uh, uh, make it explicit. Maybe here. Okay. I say given the function psi x, which is periodic, I write this as uh, sum over k, all those 2 pi over n times n, the uh, phi n of k of x times coefficients, and the coefficient is tilde. Sorry, I'm messing up the notation. This is k. Phi tilde is unnormalized, and therefore I put the coefficient, and the coefficient can be calculated by taking the scalar product, right? So the coefficient is phi k sub. Okay? So shall I calculate it? Yes. So the coefficient phi k sub is equal to the integral between minus L over 2 and L over 2 in dx. This object gives you 1 over the square root of L. And then I have e to the minus i kx psi of x. Okay? Good. Now, remember this has another 1 over the square root of L. Okay? 1 over the square root of L e to the i kx. So you see that this square root of all factors appear here and there, okay? The usual way of writing the Fourier series is rather uh, the following. Let's, I, I write it for you and then we see, we see how, how to make up the whole thing. It is 1 over L sum over K e to the minus I Kx psi K, okay? So I say that I express psi of x as 1 over n sum over k, the uh, basic, oh, e to the plus i, sorry, okay, times the Fourier coefficient of psi of k. Now, can you tell me what I have done here? I essentially have defined this object to be square root of l times this coefficient here, p tilde k. Okay, and I put an extra factor 1 over square root of L there to compensate Excuse for that. Excuse me, sir? Yeah. Uh, sir, I cannot see it. It's completely blurred. The equation psi of x is equal to summation k. After that, I cannot see it. This one? Last three steps. Uh, uh, upper from it? Upper, uh, upper one. Yeah. yeah. This one? This one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just write it better. So, yeah, psi of x equal to sum over the k, phi tilde of k, this normalized plane waves, times the scalar product of phi tilde of k with psi. Okay? Which I calculate here. So, 1 over square root of l times this object. And now I'm proposing to add a further square root of L here in such a way that this square root of L factor uh, uh, is eliminated so I, I put an extra square root of L in this thing and I put here 1 over square root of L extra factor so I add it here and there and therefore it's the same but now this 1 over square root of L with the, remember, 1 over square root of L that is already in front of phi tilde yeah, will in the end give you back 1 over L. Can you see now? Okay? It's a little game of multiplying and dividing by square root of L because the, the usual expressions uh, of Fourier series are written like this. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now you might say uh, this is very, very uh, boring. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, what, yeah. the, what, the, what the square root of L? Uh, can you explain? 
explain Yeah. Okay. So as we have chosen the basis in order to be orthonormal, I need a one over square root of n. But the convention for Fourier series is slightly different. It is that you have one over L sum over times the coefficient. So in order to comply with this convention, I rather multiply the Fourier coefficient, which would be 1 over square root of L times that, by a square root of L, in such a way that this Fourier coefficient, let me write it here, sum of k, has no square root of L factor and is the integral between minus L and L in dx of e to the minus i k x sideways. Okay? That's the Fourier coefficient. And the Fourier series is this. 1 over L sum over k e to the i k x times the Fourier coefficient. That's the standard. You see there are no square root of L. This is the uh, writing in terms of this normal life function with the one over square root of L. They are slightly different, and but you can go from one to the other easily. Is it clear? Which? This one? Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, I'll do that. In fact, what's going on? I will write here. So, sin of x equal 1 over L sum over k e to the r k x psi k. Okay? That's the Fourier series. Fourier series. And this is the Fourier coefficient. Okay? Remember, you calculate the coefficient by doing the integral. Hmm? This is the standard. Well, you can obtain it from this normalized wave function in the way that I have indicated. I'm just playing a little bit with the square root of Is it clear? Okay, now, do you want to stop for a couple of minutes to breathe? Okay, let's stop for uh, just two minutes, okay? Okay, this is for every finite L, periodic function, repeated, everything is discrete. I obtain back the Fourier series. The next goal is how you take the limit L going to infinity. Hmm? What happens in the limit L going to infinity? This discrete mesh becomes a continuum, the real line. This discrete spectrum becomes a continuum, the positive real axis, okay? And this functions becomes periodic over a lambda and lambda interval. Okay. Let's see how to do that uh, in a nice way. Uh, one thing that I would like you to notice is the following. Suppose that I take this function here. Okay. So I now take a new candidate function, phi k of x. Okay, which is 1 over square root of 2 pi times e to the i k x. Okay? Not 1 over square root of L. 1 over square root of 2 pi. Uh, let's calculate exactly the uh, scalar product I indicated there. Okay? But, so, for a finite L, but this, with, with this new normalization factor, okay? Well, you realize immediately that this is equal to, let's see, L over 2 pi times the uh, objects that you have. Because this object here is essentially square root of L over 2 pi times phi tilde, okay? Is it clear? It's just a, a factor, so if you want this new thing, you get L over 2 pi times phi tilde, okay, phi tilde, okay, prime.
But you know that this object is the delta, okay? Or, so you can write it in, in, in two possible ways. Either as L over 2 pi times the Kronecker delta, or totally equivalently, using this expression here, 1 over pi, you see, L cancels, the 2 cancels, but the pi remains, sine of k prime minus k, L over 2, divided by k prime minus k. Okay? This is the normalization. Very, very strange, right? Well, you might say, why strange? Well, first of all, you realize that for k and k prime different, when L becomes very large, you still have zero, but when they are exactly the same, this object becomes very large, not one as before. So this normalization is such that the value k equal to k prime now are a very large number. Okay, so somehow we have a situation where the, rather than the current case, is large number, L over 2 pi, zero. Mm. This starts already suggesting that you are going towards the Dirac, but how precisely you approach the Dirac, but let's, let me explain precisely, I mean, uh, take it with the appropriate quotation marks, okay? We are not mathematicians. Although, I mean, many of these things can be made mathematically reasonably rigorous, okay? With the theory of distributions, uh, they are in fact made perfectly rigorous, but uh, we, w we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But look at this, look at this object, okay? In fact, let's plot, let's plot the following function, okay? The function that I would like you to study is the following. One over pi, sign of n times x divided by x. Okay, let's plot it here. Okay, this is x. I'm substituting k prime minus k, the difference between the two k vector with some x. Okay, it's a dummy name, so don't think that I'm going to position spaces. You want to call it y? Let's call it y, so that no confusion arises. Okay? So this is y. Let's plot this function. For uh, y equal to 0, can you calculate the limit? Huh? You put an n here, and an n here, so it's n over pi. n over pi. Okay? Now, let's see uh, what happens when this function becomes zero? First of all, it's even, you see, because sine is odd, y is odd, so it's even. So let's take care of the positive part only. So there is a first point where the function becomes zero because uh, n times y is equal to pi. So at this point, which is pi over n, the function becomes zero, okay? And then it's zero again at all those multiples. But you see by the way I, I, I'm drawing it, uh, it decreases. It decreases because there is this y in the denominator, okay? So here it decreases, if I were to draw the envelope, it would be roughly going like one over one. Hmm? Like, depending on the like. Okay, so it oscillates and decreases. And it's concentrated, mostly concentrated, with a very large peak. n over pi, if n is a million, this is a very large peak. Well, this one you can calculate, you can plot it. It becomes, always goes to zero. And this point where you get zero becomes, for n, very, very large, very, very small. You see, pi over n, okay? So it becomes more and more concentrated close to the origin with a very large peak, okay? And obviously here it's negative, okay? Now I can ask you, 
Can we calculate the integral of this function? Okay, integral between minus infinity and plus infinity, 1 over pi of n times the sine of n y divided by y. The answer is yes. You can calculate. It is 1. Again, one of those integrals that I look in Google okay? <laughs> or in GraphStack. Hmm? Nicely, so the function is, so the value in the origin is pretty large, but the integral is always 1. Hmm? So this is one good way of defining a Dirac delta. This delta for, for, for this uh, finite value of n. Hmm? It is a function that is large in the origin. Why? Whose total integral is always 1. Okay, so when you calculate somehow the integral with this function here of any function, hmm? essentially the contribution term to close to 0 are amplified and all the others are just um, put to 0. And in the limit in which n goes to infinity, this integral becomes f of 0. Okay, so in some sense this object is a legitimate um, finite, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, I mean, I don't get the, the, the word. It's a legitimate, not discretization. Um, it's something that approaches the Dirac delta function for n going to infinity. Okay? So when n going, goes to infinity, this object becomes morally the delta function. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, good. So you realize that indeed this object for l going to infinity becomes the delta function of k prime minus k. Okay? Yeah, no clear. Okay. okay, nice fact. You can still argue in the following way. We will still get more and more convinced about this. Okay, let's argue the following way. Uh, suppose that I have this discrete set of, uh, of k vectors and I ask you um, how do I calculate the integral of any function of k on the full axis, on the full real axis. You might say, oh, I know how to do it. I do Riemann sums. So I pass from the integral to the discrete sum over all these k vectors, right? That's the typical thing that you do to calculate integrals on the computer, by the way. Hmm? You just make your uh, continuous variable discretize in small intervals and you calculate the sum. But you have to remember, okay, that when you calculate the, uh, so suppose that I have here f of k. So let me just draw a function now, now not the spectrum, a function, f of k. Then I have, I want to do the rectangles, okay, so the Riemann sums. Mm -hmm. Then what I do is I put the basis of the rectangle, which is 2 pi over L. And then I do the sum over k of the value of the function at the k points. Is it clear? Okay? This is the real sum discretization of this integral. Okay? Or, put it differently, in the limit in which L goes to infinity, this real sum becomes the integral. Is it clear? Very good. Now, let's finish our understanding of this story in the following way. Remember that this object were nicely discretized, okay? And therefore, what I have is the following. F of K. Suppose that I work with discrete factors. This equal to the sum over all K prime of F of K prime times the Kronecker delta 
in trying to take. Why? I mean, this is a trivial risk statement. If I want to write the value of a function at the k point, I just sum over all of them by restricting with the curve. Right? You agree? I know that I write stupid things, but allow me. Okay? Good. Now, since I, I want to insist in doing stupid things, let me multiply by n over 2 pi and by 2 pi over n. Okay? I do nothing. I just multiply n over n. But now you see that this object here is precisely the object that I told you becomes the Dirac. Okay? So this thing, for n going to infinity, will approach the Dirac k prime minus k. And this object here, for n going to infinity, becomes what? It becomes the integral over dk prime of f of k prime times the Dirac of k minus k prime. Do you agree that this is the expression you expect for the Dirac delta function? f of k is equal to the integral of all k prime of f of k prime times the Dirac delta function of k minus k prime. Now we have an integral. Mm. Okay? So things are absolutely consistent. Mm. So the limit of L going to infinity of this periodic boundary condition set of states is actually pretty well defined. The critical delta becomes Dirac delta, the discrete k points become a continuum, the discrete spectrum becomes a continuum, and the Fourier series. That's the last thing we need to do. Would it become a Fourier transform? But it would be nice. Okay. Let's check, and then we stop. Okay. Okay. Let's check. So I look at this. Okay. Look at this in particular. Psi of x equal to 1 over n, sum over k, e to the i k x, psi of k. Now, let me add a factor 2 pi, and then I put a factor 2 pi there. Okay? So what happens in the limit l going to infinity? This is the Riemann sum. 2 pi over n, sum over k. I told you that it becomes the integral. Okay? So this thing becomes, for L going to infinity, the integral over dk. Notice, divided by 2 pi, which is the usual way in which the integrals are written. You have the k and the 2 pi in the domain. Okay? And then I have e to the i k x psi of k. Okay? This is precisely uh, the inverse Fourier transform formula. Okay? Let's look at this formula here. The Fourier coefficient, psi of k equal to the integral between minus n over 2 and n over 2 in dx e to the minus i kx psi of x. What happens for l going to infinity? Nothing could be simpler. For L going to infinity, this becomes the integral between minus infinity and plus infinity in the x e to the minus i k x psi of x, which is what last time we called p tilde of k or whatever, something. I mean, it's often denoted by psi hat of k, the Fourier transform of a function psi. You put a hat not because it is an operator, but to mean it's the Fourier transform. It's not the same function of psi calculated as k. That's the meaning. Hmm? Well, you could call it like this if you want. Okay? So you see, these two formulas become straight away from being Fourier series with Fourier coefficient. With this particular globalization notice, that's the reason why I insisted in having one over L and not one over square root of L and things like this. With this normalization, they become straight Fourier uh, and inverse Fourier transforms. Hmm? Okay? Good. 
So we have understood every single detail of this very strange and pathological case, a free particle in 1D, 2D or 3D would be the same, by the way. Okay? So the eigenfunctions are not normalizable in infinite space, but if you take a finite uh, cell attitude, periodically repeated, then you can make sense of everything, everything is under control, and you can take the limit L going to infinity and reproduce, I mean, things that you can understand from Fourier series to Fourier transform, curve effect to Dirac, and so on and so forth. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do you get 1 over 2 plus over 3? Where? Uh, before n before going to infinity. And the sum? Here? Uh -huh. Why do I put, there was a 1 over n here, I put 2 pi over 2 pi. Why do, do I want to 1 over 2 pi? Oh. That is the question. The question is, is, you see this Fourier, this Riemann sum, this is the Riemann sum. The Riemann sum. Now, the coefficient in front of the sum is forced by the length of these rectangles, the basis, which is 2 pi over L. So there is a 2 pi there. I have to put it. Right? So the correct formula to go from Riemann sums to integral is 2 pi over L sum over the case goes into the integral. Okay? Now, since I want this 2 pi over L to reconstruct the integral, necessarily I have to put the 2 pi and divide by 2 pi, which means that at the end of the day, I will have the integral divided by 2 pi. Okay? By the way, mathematicians don't like this two formulas because they are asymmetric, okay? And they define things in such a way that you have one over square root of two pi and one over square root of two pi in a more symmetric fashion, which is, by the way, the convention I used in my first lecture, okay? So look at, you can decide how you want to define the Fourier uh, transforms, if symmetric or less symmetric. This is a tend to uh, use this, the mathematicians are uh, more symmetric guys, and therefore they like the square root of two pi. Okay? Uh, I, do, I do have essentially five minutes that I want to invest uh, or waste. You can decide. <laughs> yeah? You decide. Okay, don't tell me. And this is the following. It is starting to think of the interpretation of, of uh, the wave function. What it means. So far we said, ah, that's the probability, the modulus square of the wave function is the probability density of finding the particle somewhere. Mm. And then you can start thinking of experiments in which the question of how to properly interpret this probability density uh, makes a certain difference on what you expect. Now this part of the story I anticipate is strongly connected to the question of interpretation of quantum mechanics, so it's slightly, um, how should I call it, a slippery uh, floor, so don't, don't worry too much. I'm not an expert in foundations of quantum mechanics, by the way, so the things that uh, I tell you just take them as uh, layman type of view of that uh, subject. Uh, also, it is connected to the aspect of measurements in quantum mechanics that we will later on uh, discuss more. So more about some of these aspects will come out. But I want to give you some, just some fresh impression, 10 minute discussion about interpretation with in mind, if you remember the Tomomura experiment, the Itachi experiment, mm, which uh, worked uh, uh, like this essentially. Uh, I have here uh, a, 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 an emitter of electrons, okay, and some gates such that the electron uh, uh, has to essentially go uh, in one of those two fenditures, okay, mm, and here there is a screen 
and you send electrons, the electron head to the side, they go right, they go left, they end somewhere, they hit the screen, and in the end, they form fringes. By repeatedly sending electrons, each of them absolutely independent of the next one, Nevertheless, it's like if they communicate to each other and they say, oh, no, let's go there, it's better. Okay? So, there are places where they try to do that. How they do that, okay? I don't know. But let's think of, uh, let's think of the following thing, okay? Suppose that I have a similar kind of uh, experiment. Uh, I have a source which emits the quantum particles are electrons, but let me tell you that people have done this experiment that I'm trying to tell you with photons, okay? And what we, uh, we conclude indeed was found in the experiment. So it's not a ridiculous thought experiment, it's something that people can do, at uh, least with photons. Uh, suppose that they uh, say into the part of those particles that are emitted from the source, a beam splitter. For photons it's absolutely simple thing. It's a half silver mirror. Okay? So this mirror can uh, let the photon pass or bounce it. Okay? Reflect it. It's one of the, those tools that they buy at the store to prepare their optic, quantum optics apparatus. Okay? So here there is a kind of beam splitter which you now think of some potential barrier for this particle, so the particle arrives at the barrier, okay, and can get uh, the wave function, okay, at that point, somehow is modified by the barrier, part of it goes here, part of it goes there, okay, so suppose that I send a, a wave packet, okay, it arrives at this little mount, the wave packet splits in two, a function, say, psi 2, in the function psi 1 here, okay? They travel into different directions and you will put a detector here and another detector there, okay? So, I don't know if the picture is clear, I prepare a wave packet, some wave function, psi x, emitted from here and I let it evolve, it's a wave packet, goes, bounces into the splitter, it splits in two, piece of wave function goes here, piece of wave function goes there, okay? Detectors. And I count things. So suppose that I send this particle very, very diluted in time, okay? In every single uh, interval, there is essentially one particle that is emitted, and then the next one will come after a long time, okay? So, uh, I essentially <coughs> Uh, define, uh, I emit them with a rate r, and in a small interval delta t, the probability that I see a particle is r, the rate times delta t, and this is small. Okay? This is my assumption. Okay? The rate of emission of particle is uh, small. What's, what's r? The rate, emission rate. Okay? So the probability of observing a particle is a small event. Okay? Because I emit them very, very rare. Now, um, these two functions, psi 2 of x and t, let me just draw it like this, are localized in very, very distant uh, regions of space. And here, essentially, the function is zero everywhere else, okay? So the wave particle is different from zero here, and then different from zero here and there. And you arrange the beam splitter in such a way that the total integral of this um, psi 1 modulus square, psi 1 of x, in the region around B1, around this detector here, is uh, one half, and the total integral there around 
d2 psi 2 of x is equal to 1 half. In other words, the total integral everywhere in space is 1, but is essentially precisely divided into 1 half here and 1 half there. Okay? A beam splitter, which is nicely calibrated, half and half, will allow you to do that, for instance. The photo only passes with probability one half and is reflected with probability one half. Okay? So, in other words, you can, if an electron is emitted, with probability one half, you see the thick there, and with probability one half, you see the thick there. Hmm? But now the question is, can you see coincidences? In other words, can you see ticks there and there at the same time? You realize this is a wave function, and if it was a normal wave, okay, the wave is here and there, okay? Can I see tick at the same time at both? For a classical wave, the answer would be yes. Okay, so if this was a physical object, a physical wave, like the wave in the in the in the in the in the, in the sea, okay, there's a piece of the wave that hits there and hits there, and obviously, I mean, if you have calibrated such that these two distances are absolutely the same, obviously, if you make them different in length, uh, one or like before one, no. You calibrate everything perfectly, so this is exactly equal to that. The probability is one half, ta ta, they are all at the same time. There is the coincidence. If this was a grain in the physical space, this would be the outcome. The answer is no. You never observe coincidences. Either the particle ticks here or it ticks there. This is somehow a struggling fact. So when you measure the particle, you cannot measure at the same time here and there with probability one half as if it was an ordinary wave just going into possible channels, but you measure either there or there. Okay? So psi x is in some sense an object that tells you a statistical interpretation. If you say many, many repeated experiment of the same time, many particles, okay? And you ask yourself, what is the probability that I observe this particle there or there, huh? then you can extract results out of psi of x. But do not insist in picturing psi of x as a physical wave and therefore concluding about possible outcomes of experiments which in the end are disproved in the lab, okay? If you do it, this experiment with photons, you never see the photons half here and half there and provoking a coincidence. In other words, the photon is always the full photon and comes here. The same the electron. You cannot split it in two. Okay? Either the electron arrives here or arrives there. Never in coincidence. Okay? So this one half thing is only the probability that there is gone this way. Not that half is here and half is there. Is it clear? Okay? So think in a statistical fashion, huh? uh, and this is strongly connected with the theory of measure. Measure is a probabilistic aspect of quantum mechanics. So far we have seen totally deterministic sharing the equation, evolution in time, everything moves according to differential equation. Now it could be more deterministic than a differential equation. Okay? And now comes a, 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 an act of measuring something where the outcome is totally random. Okay? If you send several particles, half of them go here and there, but you would never be able to say, I know, we will go there. No, half and half in a random fashion. It's, in fact, it's a perfect random number generator quantum mechanics. Okay? If you want to generate zero and ones, okay, in a random fashion, you know how difficult it is to find algorithm that generates random numbers. Well, quantum mechanics is an intrinsic random number generator. You cannot predict if you go, if you go here or there. Hmm? And you can make it such that it's uh, precisely equiprobable. Equi hmm? 
Okay, I must warn you that in recent time, people have been able to actually do experiment on individual quantum systems. Okay? So you take uh, atoms in a microwave cavity and you put one atom there. There are beautiful experiments done in Paris, for instance. They were awarded the Nobel Prize to Haroche, right? who considered atoms in microwave cavities. Go and read the uh, Nobel lectures by Haroche, and you will see how uh, human, uh, I mean, the, our, human, our understanding of quantum mechanics is now going to the point that we can ask about what happens to an individual quantum system, and not just a statistic repetition of destructive measurement. By the way, when you do a measurement like this, you call it a destructive, a demolition measurement, because you absorb the electron on the screen. Okay? There are measurements now that can somehow observe the system without destroying it totally, hmm? just revealing photons emitted by the atoms and so on and so forth. Okay? So somehow we are going towards the individual atom, individual system, quantum mechanics. So this in principle would question my stress that I gave on the statistical interpretation. What about a single? What the single do? I don't know. Read Harosh if you want to know more about this. Okay, I think we can stop here. And uh, And we will continue uh, on Thursday. Okay? Bye bye. Say well. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye.